inevitably the Christian faith is going to be attacked in a fallen world. This is the devil's kingdom, according to my New Testament. We know that we are of him, but we also know that the whole world is in the grip of the evil one. And we're told every day to pray to be delivered from the evil one. That's the real version of the Lord's Prayer. Not from evil, but from the evil one, from the devil. So the Lord's Prayer, as we call it, begins with Father in heaven, but it ends with the devil on earth. And the two ways in which he attacks are he will attack the messengers of the gospel and the message of the gospel. He attacks the messengers by trying to get them to misbehave, to let the side down, to disobey God, not to follow his will. But that's another story, and I'm sure you have had plenty of teaching on that. The two biggest dangers in that area are for the messengers to fall into license and do what they want, or into legalism and overemphasize the law of God. And I've seen churches that have done both. Some churches go into license, don't care what their members do, and other churches go into legalism, and either way you kill the life of the church. But we're concerned this afternoon with the message and how the devil seeks to pervert it and to spoil the gospel. We've seen how the gospel depends on Jesus being both fully human and fully div divine. And the devil wants to spoil one or the other. One of the first attacks he made on the Christian faith we call docetism, which simply means not believing that Jesus came in flesh like ours, but that he appeared as a kind of phantom or angel. And yes, there are still people who think that Jesus was not real. Even today, people deny his existence, though there are very few who can do that. Now, even in the New Testament days, people were attacking his humanity, which is why John, in his two letters, two of the three, said, if a person doesn't believe that Jesus came in the flesh, they are not a Christian. We need to believe in the real humanity of Jesus. Now, believers have a problem with Jesus' humanity. Unbelievers, their problem is with his divinity. But we're so used to worshiping Jesus, seeing him in a stained glass window, that we forget he was really human. The disciples were not among those who doubted Jesus' humanity. They'd lived with it. They'd eaten with him. They'd slept with him. They'd walked with him. They'd talked with him. They knew Jesus was real and that he was fully human. And to them it was astonishing that some people had difficulty with that. But we have difficulty with it. I mentioned before that Jesus had to empty his bowels and bladder every day just like we do. You never hear that talked about in church or even imagined. And yet Jesus talked about it. I'll tell you where afterwards if you're interested. <laughs> but he was a real human being, just like us. And one of the ways in which the devil tries to destroy the Christian message is to convince people that Jesus wasn't real, that he wasn't fully human, that he was a heavenly visitor, a phantom, a ghost. But the main attack that he makes is on the divinity of Jesus, because that, after all, is the key. That's who he was. And it's only when they realized who he was that he went to Jerusalem to die, 
because only, <coughs> only then would people understand what was happening and what he was achieving. So the devil attacks us morally and mentally. And it's the mental attack that I'm concerned with now. I've shown you that John's Gospel was written almost entirely <coughs> to support the deity of Jesus, that he was the Son of God. That's because he lived in Ephesus, where he looked after Mary for the rest of her life, the mother of Jesus. But in Ephesus, there was a man called Corinthus or Serinthus. And he said that Jesus was not fully divine, not fully human, that he was somewhere in between the two, that he could mediate on our behalf because he was between us and God, but he was not fully God. Now John knew about this. One day John was taken to the public baths for a walk and he was in the water and he spotted Serinthus at the other end of the Roman baths. And he shouted to his friends, get me out of here, get me out of here. And they thought something was terribly wrong. He said, I don't want to be in the same water as that man. And he took a strong stand against Serinthus because there's nothing more damaging than to say Jesus was not fully divine, just a little less than God somewhere in between. Today we have Jehovah's Witnesses saying that Jesus is not God. And they can argue, especially from their own Bible, which has been skillfully adjusted to fit their views, but they don't believe that Jesus was God. They believe he was a creature rather than the creator that he was the firstborn of all creation. That's one of the phrases they use, and it's biblical. But that he was formed first, however long ago. He was a creature. And to say that all things were made by him and through him, and without him was not anything made that has been made, that's blasphemy to Jehovah's Witness. Now, it's really about that divinity of Jesus that I'm going to take a huge step now. <clears throat> At some point, somebody had a great idea. He said, what we need is a brief, concise statement of faith <clears throat> so that we can defend it against these who attack it. And that's how creeds were born from the word credo, which means I believe. And the very first creed that was put together by whom we don't know is the Apostles' Creed, which if you're Anglican is used every week in church. And the Apostles' Creed, I've got copies of the creeds for you. I'm going to read them. They were written to defend the faith against those who would deny it in some way. And when I read a creed to you, I want you to ask, what was the attack this was defending the faith against? Because that's why they were written. So here's the Apostles' Creed, one of the earliest, and ask yourself, what was being denied? by the attackers. I believe in God the Father Almighty, make creator of heaven and earth. And I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. How many of you are familiar with those words? Nearly all of you. So what was being said that that is written against? It may surprise you that the first point I want to make is it was written to defend his humanity. That people were already not believing that he was really human. Now, why do I dare say that? Because it mentions his birth and his death. Furthermore, there are two human beings mentioned in the Apostles' Creed, Mary the mother and Pontius Pilate, under whom he died. So this creed is saying he was born and he died which are the two basic facts of every human being who's ever lived. They probably might go on your gravestone. You were born and you died. You are human. So the first thing we say is that this was written to defend the full humanity of Jesus. And that's why Pontius Pilate went down into history because he was responsible for the death. Now you notice that we changed the word hell to the word dead. He descended to the dead. That's a better translation because it's really he descended into Hades. And when the creed was written, they weren't clear as to whether hell and Hades were the same place or different places but it means he descended to the dead. The other phrase we can misunderstand is the Holy Catholic Church. Catholic meant and means universal. It doesn't mean the Church of Rome. And when this creed was written, the Holy Catholic Church was the Holy Universal Church of all believers. So there's no problem with that. But there's also a claim to facts of divine interruption in his life. Yes, he was born of Mary, but he was conceived by the Holy Ghost. And therefore God was his father. And yes, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, but he was raised. On the third day he rose from the dead. Again, God is in there. So while it's emphasizing his true humanity, it's also emphasizing the fatherhood of God and all that God did to make Jesus possible. Now I move from that creed, which was one of the earliest, to a creed that was formed at a place called Nicaea. And it's called the Nicene Creed, which if you're Anglican, you would recite at a communion service and it's rather longer and it was written to defend the church's belief in his full divinity because there was a man at that time called Arius and he was again one of those who claimed that Jesus was a created a creature on the creator and was somewhere in between God and man, but was not fully God. Now, in the light of that, listen to the wording. We believe, that's the difference from the Apostles' Creed, not I believe, but we believe in God, one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. And that's an incredible claim. But you see what it's saying? 
it's saying he was eternally begotten. And that kills the idea of him being a creature. In other words, begotten doesn't mean that God made him. He was eternally begotten of the Father. He always was the Son of God. He didn't become the Son of God. And he was true God from true God. One, one version is very God of very God. That's really emphasizing he was fully God. And you mustn't question that. Of one being with the Father. That's all of a piece with the same thing. Through him all things were made. Quote from John's Gospel. But it's saying he was not a creature. He was the creator, as the New Testament frequently says. So it goes on, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate. Oh, there's a word that isn't in the Bible, incarnate. It means enfleshed, that he was made in carnal flesh. So somebody had begun to deny the incarnation. Became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. There's an addition. So some people were already teaching that Jesus' kingdom was not everlasting. Do you begin to see how you should read the creeds? You ask of every statement, what is it denying? And that's what was being said. And this was the church's response. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. That's new. And that is one of the early controversies. Who sent the Holy Spirit? And there were some saying God did and God alone. And others were saying that God the Father and God the Son sent the Spirit together, which is more in line with Scripture again. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. There's an additional word there, apostolic now. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. That's a new thing. The baptism wasn't in the apostles. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. What else do we know from that? There was a controversy about baptism already coming in. Perhaps because it was already being applied to babies. The next creed I want to mention was written about AD 400 and it was named after a, a great defender of the Trinity named Athanasius and it's called the Athanasian Creed. And he was particularly concerned about the people teaching that there were three gods, not one. I think this creed rather overdoes it, but listen to it. This is what the Catholic faith teaches. We worship one God in the Trinity and Trinity in unity. We distinguish among the persons, but we do not divide the substance. For the Father is a distinct person, the Son is a distinct person, and the Holy Spirit is a distinct person. Still the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have one divinity, 
equal glory and co-eternal majesty. What the Father is, the Son is, and the Holy Spirit is. The Father is uncreated, the Son is uncreated, and the Holy Spirit is uncreated. The Father is boundless, the Son is boundless, and the Holy Spirit is boundless. The Father is eternal, the Son is eternal, and the Holy Spirit is eternal. Nevertheless, they are not three eternal beings, but one eternal being. Thus, there are not three uncreated beings, nor three boundless beings, but one uncreated being and one boundless being. Likewise, the Father is omnipotent, the Son is omnipotent, and the Holy Spirit is omnipotent. Yet there are not three omnipotent beings, but one omnipotent <laughs> being. Thus, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. But there are not three gods, but one God, the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, and the Holy Spirit is Lord. There are not three lords, but one Lord. For according to creation truth, we must profess that each of the persons individually is God, and according to Christian religion, we are forbidden to say there are three gods or three lords. The Father is made of none, neither created nor begotten, the Son of the Father alone, not made nor created, but begotten. The Holy Spirit is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created, nor begotten, but proceeding. So there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. And in this Trinity, none is before nor after another, None is greater or less than another, but the whole three persons are co-eternal and co-equal, so that in all things, as aforesaid, the unity in Trinity and the Trinity in unity is to be worshipped. <laughs> I think he's made his point. <laughs> But the, the church was so anxious to keep the faith on track. And in this case, they were so anxious not to divide God into three, which again can easily be done. They are not the same person, but they are the same God. Mm -hmm. That's this most difficult part for us to grasp. Well, I'll come back to that in a moment. One more creed to tell you. It's called the Chalcedonian Creed because of where it was written in AD 451. Now again, as I read, think, what is this denying? Therefore, following the Holy Fathers, we all with one accord Teach men to acknowledge one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at once complete in Godhead and complete in manhood, truly God and truly man, consisting also of a reasonable soul and body, of one substance with the Father as regards his Godhead, and at the same time of one substance with us as regards his manhood. Like us in all respects apart from sin, as regards his Godhead begotten of the Father before the ages, but yet as regards his manhood begotten for us men and for our salvation of Mary the Virgin the God-bearer, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, recognized in two natures, without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. The distinction of natures being in no way annulled by the union, but rather the characteristics of each nature 
being preserved and coming together to form one person and subsistence, not as parted or separated into two persons, but one and the same Son and only begotten God, the Word, Lord Jesus Christ, even as the prophets from earliest times spoke of him and our Lord Jesus Christ himself taught us and the creeds of the fathers has handed down to us. Now again, he's concerned here not about the Holy Spirit yet, but about the Son. That there were two natures brought together in perfect harmony, the divine and the human combined in Christ. Now those are all the creeds I'm going to read to you but they were all written to defend the faith and keep it pure. And I'm grateful to those who worked at it. Don't go along with everything they said. They're not infallible, they're not scripture, and we mustn't treat them as scripture. There are some things, for example, that they say that I have problems with. One of the last that I've read called Mary the God-bearer. Did you notice that? Theotokos is the Greek word. And unfortunately, people got a hold of that and began to talk about Mary as, as the mother of God. Have you heard that? Catholics now believe that as dogma. She was not the mother of God. She never was the mother of God. She was the mother of God's son. She was not the mother of God. That puts her above God and is one of the reasons why Catholics have such a veneration for Mary, the mother of God. But she was the mother of the Son, the mother of one of the three persons, but not of the other two. She was not the mother of the Holy Spirit. She was not the mother of God the Father. So we need to, again, realize the creed didn't claim that she was mother of God, but that she was a God-bearer. And that is true. But <coughs> when you turn that into mother of God, it's gone too far. Now, after those creeds, there are still huge issues that theologians have to tackle, and which they're still tackling. There are two in particular. Number one, is there any order? How do they relate to each other? Is there a subordination? Feminist theologians categorically deny that. But there is an order. The Father sent the Son the Son and the Father sent the Spirit. Nobody sent the Father. It's a word that's never used of the Father. Jesus came to do his Father's will. Did it voluntarily? Perfectly. But he came to glorify the Father. The Holy Spirit came to glorify the Son. And they don't glorify the other way. Though the Son did pray, Father, glorify me with glorify with the glory I had at the beginning. But there does seem an order. And in every creed, there were always three sections, and they were always in the odd order, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In other words, the Father has the priority. His will is the basic that the other two do. So there is a certain order there, a certain subordination of a voluntary kind, which raised the second issue, are they equal? And the answer is they are subordinate in some ways and equal in others. They are equal in glory, equal in status, equal in 
so many ways. But there is an order, order there. And then came another big question, how long has God been three? And there are some even today who say he became three persons in order to save us. That's called the economic theory of the Trinity. <laughs> but the final answer of Christians has been they were always Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now it's at this point that I can see your brains beginning to stretch a bit, and they certainly do. Let's come to modern errors, which does suggest that we might need modern creeds to counter modern errors. There are still churches that cannot accept that God is three persons. We call them Unitarian churches, and America is full of them. They worship one God, but they do not include the Trinity. They talk about Jesus, they talk about the Holy Spirit. So did the Jehovah's Witnesses. But the Trinity is still a nato. There's a group of Pentecostals called the Oneness Pentecostal. Any of you heard of them? Again, America seems to produce these things. And the oneness Pentecostals believe that God is one and that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are just the one God, which frankly means that God the Father died on the cross for you. That's been a well-known error for centuries. The Father didn't die on the cross. It was the Son who died on the cross. Father deserted his Son because he was making him sin on our behalf. But the error has been exposed as patripassianism. Sorry for these long words. Patri, Father, pass, suffers. Patripassianism is the error that God was on the cross. And people can still, without thinking, talk like that. But it's not the truth. I've mentioned Jehovah's Witnesses. I've mentioned feminists. And the feminists make a big attack on the Trinity. They cannot bear the thought that anybody is subordinate to anybody else, that anybody is under someone else's will. And there are obvious reasons why they believe that, but to apply it to God is a mistake because it's from God, as I'm going to show you in a moment, that we get our pattern. And I'm going to say something here that I'd ask you to think about carefully I believe many evangelicals are Trinitarian in theory, but in practice are binitarian. And some of you have been in churches where the Trinity that seems to be in practice, the Trinity, is Father, Son, and Holy Scripture. Do you know what I mean? You will not hear much talk about the Holy Spirit in such churches. And they believe that the gifts of the Spirit ceased 2,000 years ago when the scripture was complete. I think I don't need to say more. Nevertheless, in practice, that is anti-Trinitarian. It may not be in theory, but in practice you will hear a lot of talk about the Father, and about the Son, and about the Holy Scripture, but very little about the Holy Spirit. I say that advisedly. I don't want to be Christian, to be objectively critical, but I used to be that sort of evangelical. And I dreaded preaching on Pentecost Sunday, and I was always glad to get back to the Gospel the next week. 
and I could get enough out of books to make two sermons on Pentecost Sunday. But that's all it was. And for the rest, I confess that I could preach many, many sermons and never mention him. That's a very subtle form of what I call binitarianism. And it means that many people in such churches don't know the Holy Spirit as a person. They don't know him to talk to, or they don't know him to listen to. And I believe that I'm a charismatic evangelical, in other words. I believe we need both the Holy Spirit and the Father and the Son, and that we need all three together as the Holy Scripture tells us. So let me come to today. How are we going to explain all this to people? I've got some diagrams now. Mathematically equations. The top equation is one that many people think we believe and teach and they can't understand why we don't believe in three gods. For them, the mathematics of it are one plus one plus one equals three. But I would submit there's another mathematical equation that is nearer the truth. One times one times one equals one. But God is not tied to mathematics. But I'll just give you that in case you want another mathematical formula that makes more sense when you're talking about the Trinity. Just change plus to times and you're in a whole different world. But I've got a diagram here. Some people want symbols. In many churches you'll see this symbol in the architecture or carved in wood at the end of the pew. And that's always a symbol of the Trinity. When Patrick, the Welsh boy that was a slave, went to evangelize Ireland, he used the shamrock. And it's become the Irish national plant. And he said, is that one leaf or three? It has three lobes, but it only has one stem. So is that one leaf or three? And he used the shamrock as a kind of symbol of the Trinity to help people to understand. I think analogies don't help at all. I had a professor at Cambridge who said, I want you to think of three eggs in a frying pan and the whites have flowed into one, but there are three yellow yolks. He said, that's a picture of the Trinity. Well, God is not eggs in a frying pan. No. <laughs> but all, all such analogies fall down. His favorite analogy is water, H2O, which can be steam, water, or ice, a vapor, a liquid, or a solid. And I've heard that used as an argument for the Trinity. But again, it breaks down because water can never be all three at the same time. It will either change into ice or change into steam, but it's never ice, water, and steam together. So it's not an analogy. So I really say forget analogies. I have one diagram which I found helpful. And I don't know if you can all see it. It's a triangle with father at the top, son at one apex and spirit at another. And then there are various lines connecting them. The long line on the outside is a line that said, is not. 
So the Father is not the Spirit. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. But in the middle of the diagram is the word God. And shorter lines connect the three to the center. And the shorter line says is, is, is. The Father is God. The Son is God. And the Spirit is God. They're different from each other but they are all God. Now that doesn't argue anything, but I've found it a helpful diagram to keep in my mind. It keeps me to orthodox. And it just mentally says something to my mind that I need to remember. But let's move on. I think the most important thing I want to say now is this. Dynamic precedes doctrine. Experience comes before explanation. That was how it was in the Bible days. It was because they experienced the dynamic of the Trinity and then had to work out the doctrine. That's the order. And therefore I say earnestly to you, don't try and explain the Trinity to an unbeliever. Tell them about the dynamic first. Introduce them to the threefold relationship first. Don't try and argue them into believing in the Trinity until they've met all three persons. And therefore, with unbelievers, I beg you, don't waste your time arguing about the Trinity. Preach the gospel to them. Amen. Introduce them to all three persons. Then you're not going to have any difficulty telling them they've met the same God in all three. So that's the first practical application of what we've been learning this afternoon. Don't try and convince unbelievers of the Trinity. You'll never make it. They'll tie you up in knots before you get anywhere. Introduce them to the experience of the Trinity and then they'll be ready to listen to the doctrine. And they need to hear the doctrine but only after they've experienced three relationships. And I mean all three. They need to be introduced to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit from the very beginning of their Christian life. Too many have to wait years before they're introduced to the Holy Spirit as a personal relationship. We only know the Father through the Son. And no man comes to the Father except through the Son. And those are the first two that most Christians are introduced to. But why aren't they introduced to the Holy Spirit as well? Because when they're baptized, which should come early in the Christian life, they will be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And how can they be baptized into the name of a person they don't know? Now, of course, here we have a problem. Jesus himself said, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. And the word the is very important because that's what, what makes it a person. We don't have a threefold name for God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as if that's his name. It, his name is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And that makes sure that you're treating them as separate persons, different from each other. 
Now the problem is that the name there is singular. And here again we have a grammatical conundrum. The single name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The single name of three persons. It's a contradiction grammatically and mathematically, but it's the truth. And so I believe our basic task is to introduce people to all three, if necessary, one by one, but hopefully as closely together as possible, so that they've met and know all three. And yet they will know instinctively they're dealing with the same God in all three. Now I come to the most important thing I want to say. Let me put this very carefully. The real answer to the conundrum of the Trinity is to ask in what sense is God three and in what sense is he one? Don't ever confuse those two things. There are some senses in which God is three and other senses in which God is one, but the two are different and must never be the same. Let's just ask first about the three. God is three persons. The Father is not the Son and is not the Spirit. His threeness is persons. He is not one person. You follow me? If only we had not allowed our minds to slip into thinking that he was three persons and one person at the same time. That's where we make the problem for people. He is three persons, but one God. So what he is three is different from what he is as one. Now I hope you follow me in that. Because then it, it's no longer a problem. He is only three in some senses and only one in entirely different senses. You're not asking that the three and the one be applied to the same thing. That's when you're into contradiction and mathematical nonsense. So get this clearly, the three only applies to three persons. The problem then is of course, in what sense are the three one? Not in personhood. We know what a person is. I'm a person, you're a person. I'm not you, you're not me, we're different. So how do we get the oneness? There's only one human analogy that helps, and that is sexual intercourse. Now that's the analogy that the Bible uses when two become one flesh. And we can use that analogy, it only goes as far as getting two into one but at least we can say now God is one step beyond that, he's three into one. And you know, Jesus said quite specifically, I and the Father are one. But he did not mean one person. He meant two in perfect harmony, sharing the same nature, the same attitudes, the same attributes. Three share one nature, not one person. The three persons are in total harmony. Now let me finish, and it may not just be two minutes, I'm afraid. Let me finish by asking, what's the importance of all this? What's the relevance of all this? Isn't the Trinity just a theory and 
How did it impact my daily life? Well, the crucial question in all religion is what kind of God you believe in. And that is going to affect everything else. Let's take Islam. They don't believe in a trinity. They believe in one person called God. One person. We believe in three persons. What difference does that make? Quite simply, for us, God is above us, beside us, and within us. God the Father is above us, so we can worship a God in heaven. But he became Emmanuel, God with us, God beside us, God sharing our nature. And when you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, you know that God is within you. Now, if you overemphasize any of those three, you come to an unbalanced view of God. Islam overemphasizes the God above us. And that's all they have. But we have a God who came beside us and said, I'll send you another standby. That's what the word comforter means there. Standby. I'll send you another standby and he will be within you. So if you ask, where is my God? He's above me. He's beside me. He's in me. And that's my whole being covered. My whole existence is in God. And I've got the God I need. I need a God who's above me. I need a God who's beside me. I need a God who's within me. And that's the three dimension of my life. And God fills all three. And only God the Trinity does that. Allah can't do that. There's no claim in the Quran that he can. He can't. He will always be a solitary person above them. And you can't have that beside relationship with him. But Emmanuel means God with us, God beside us. And the Holy Spirit means God within me. Now if you overemphasize God within you, you reduce him in size. He becomes a little God in your heart. Or you can overemphasize that in Christ he became beside us and miss out on the within. And the Christian alone of all the religions in the world can boast of a God above us, beside us, and within us. Now that's the most important fact of the Trinity. If you don't believe in the Trinity, you will lose at least one or two of those three things. And that would be a tragedy. What does this mean for God? It means that God is relational. God has relations within himself. And therefore, only Christianity can ever say and it's the only religion that has said, God is love. Because you can't have love with a solitary person. Love is a relationship. And therefore Allah in Islam has no relationships. He can't be love. They never call him love. He can't be father because they say he has no son. Can you begin to see how the Trinity is precious to us. It's a vital part of our whole religion. God is love. He always was love. He always will be love. When there was no human being to love, he loved his son, he loved his Holy Spirit, and they loved him. And salvation is being invited into that family love. 
It's being brought in as adopted sons to share the love they already had in that threesome. Do you begin to see something bigger in this than just creeds and arguments? It's crucial. Thank God for the creeds that preserve the truth for us. Because if they hadn't worked out those statements, we could have gone astray years ago. God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not three gods, but one God and Father of us all. The next thing I want to say is that God, having made us in his image, has given us the pattern for our relationships with each other. And if you ask me why God created human beings, my answer is utterly simple. He already had one son and one spirit to love, and he found that that love was so pleasant and so such a delight that he wanted a bigger family. And that's the reason why we're here, to be that bigger family. And there's no other reason that you're here on earth except that. You're here to become God, adopted sons and daughters, part of his eternal love family. And therefore, among the redeemed, the Trinity is the pattern for how we live together. It sounds so obvious when you say it, but that's what Jesus prayed for. Jesus prayed for us who would believe on the apostles' doctrine. And he prayed that we may be one as he is one with the Father. So the Trinity becomes the pattern for your relationship to the fellow believers in your church. Isn't that amazing? That the Trinity of love should be visible in the church. See how these Christians love each other. That's how we'll persuade the, the world about the Trinity by demonstrating it among ourselves. Can you begin to see the importance of the Trinity? The delight of it? Instead of regretting that you have to believe in the Trinity to be a Christian, you can rejoice that God is a Trinity and that therefore there's a pattern that's always been there of how to live together. And this applies to everything as well as everyone. God's intention, his plan, was to bring all things together in Christ so that we might know the harmony he's already got and that he's had forever and ever. And he simply wants us to have the same harmony. Could anything be simpler? That's how we can rejoice that we've got such a wonderful God, a God who is love, always was love, always will be, a God who wanted to share that love with us, and above all, that he wanted us to share it with each other on earth and be a demonstration of the Trinity and persuade people that people can be one in the best sense of the word. And only if we live in perfect harmony with our fellow Christians can we demonstrate the Trinity. I think I'm gonna stop there. Do you know a little chorus, Father, we adore you? lay our lives before you, how we love you. We adore the Trinity. We love the Trinity. Let's sing that quietly now together. Father, we adore you.
Yes, Father, we rejoice that you are what you are, that you are the great I am, and thank you for showing us that you are a trinity, three in one and one in three. How we love you. Help us to demonstrate that down here and convince other people that you are the Holy Trinity. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.